Welcome back, folks, to another exciting JLAM Bio exclusive video. Yesterday, I am here to talk to you about Unit 13. Gosh, it's been so long since we started Unit 1. I guess back in the beginning of the year, if you can do math. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about reaction energetics. So we are diving into some new material now. We are going to be focusing on kinetics. That is rates of chemical reactions. How do we know what rates of chemical reactions we have? How do we know how much energy is involved in those reactions? And how does energy transfer between reactants and products of a chemical reaction? It's a very exciting time, very exciting topic, so stay tuned. We'll be excited here in just a second. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Big K Diet Cola. That's right, all the great taste and no calories. Big K Diet Cola. Pick it up at your local Kroger today. refreshing. Let's move on. So our key learning objectives for this video, you will be able to explain why reactions happen in regards to energy. You should be able to explain and analyze processes of endothermic and exothermic reactions, and finally be able to evaluate factors that impact rates of chemical reactions. Now, we have quite an extensive list of vocabulary terms for this. We're going to be talking about kinetics, reaction mechanism, endothermic, exothermic reactions, energy neutral reactions, We'll talk about the reaction energy profile diagrams, reaction coordinate, net energy change, activation energy, transition state, catalyst, enzyme, substrate, and active site. So one of the questions that we want to try to answer when we look at chemical kinetics is how do atoms actually exchange partners during a chemical reaction? We know that, for example, we take a methane molecule, combine it with two oxygen molecules to produce carbon dioxide and water, but how do they actually go through and do that? Well, according to some previous theories, we need the methane and two oxygen molecules must collide with each other hard enough in order to break those bonds. Unfortunately, that's very unlikely. It's very unlikely that all three of those molecules are actually going to combine together simultaneously and at the right angles in order to be able to produce the products that are listed up above. So most reactions actually occur in simple steps which require significantly less energy. Now that is known as a reaction mechanism in order to produce our product. So the CH4 and the two oxygen molecules won't combine together that way. Um, I'm not exactly sure of what the specific reaction mechanism here is, but it is important to understand that these types of chemical reactions that are undergone here actually go under multiple step mechanisms in order to become the products that you see listed there. So in order to get a better understanding of reaction kinetics and how they work, it is imperative that we look at the speed of those reactions because we cannot study the mechanisms directly. We don't know exactly how these particular reactants become these particular products by, because we can't look at those individual mechanisms. But we can understand it by looking at the speed of the reactions. Now, chemical kinetics itself is the study of how reaction rates change. If we know what happens on a molecular level, so for example, we study the rates of change, we do understand a bit about what mechanisms occur, then we can do a variety of things to influence the rate of the reaction to either produce more product, um, to be able to speed up the reaction, things that would be very important in, say, a pharmaceutical field. Now, when we talk about energy change in chemical reactions, nearly all reactions have some form of energy change. An endothermic reaction, the total reaction absorbs more energy than goes out, more energy goes in than comes out. In an exothermic reaction, total reaction energy releases uh, energy, so more energy goes out than comes in. These are terms that you should be very familiar with, and if you look at the reaction diagrams down below, these should be very similar to what you saw in your freshman biology class. If the reaction is endothermic, then the reactants have lower amount of potential energy than the products, so therefore and more energy goes in than comes back out. For the exothermic diagram, our products are lower than our reactants because more energy goes out than comes in. So in order to look at this, we actually look at reaction energy profiles to represent energy changes in a diagram. The x-axis is known as the reaction coordinate, and that's basically just the progress of the reaction. Some people put time, those types of things. The y-axis is energy in kilojoules. So as we can see, the energy, the energy changes through the process of the reaction. Now the change in energy is known as delta E. Delta means change, um, and E just refers to the energy. And we look at whether the, uh, whether the products are higher or lower than the reactants. If it is an endothermic reaction, then delta E is positive. If it is an exothermic reaction, then delta E is negative. 
So this is very similar to what I just said previously. The delta E of the reaction is equal to the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants. If delta E of the reaction is positive, meaning that there's more energy in my products than in my reactants, then the reaction is going to be endothermic. If delta E of the reaction is negative, meaning that there are more, there is more energy in my reactants than my products, then the reaction is considered exothermic. Let's do a practice problem together. So let's take a look at the sample problem we have here using this uh, reaction diagram here. Is the reaction endothermic or exothermic? Well, the first thing we need to look at is the energy of our reactants versus the energy of our products. Our products are higher than our reactants. So therefore the reaction is endothermic. Will it feel hot or cold? Well, if you think about it, it is endothermic. So energy is going in. Energy is leaving the surroundings to go into the system. If it is absor absorbing energy from the environment, then it is going to feel cold. If it were exothermic, energy leaves the system and therefore if you put your hand on it, you will absorb the energy and it will feel hot. What is the value and sign for delta E of the reaction? Well, my products, Remember that delta E is equal to my product energy minus my reactant energy. So delta E here is 200. Okay. And these reaction diagrams are typically in kilojoules. So delta E, 200 kilojoules there. Which contains more energy, reactants or products? Well, we kind of already addressed that. It is a product. Uh, base reaction here. We have more energy in our products than our reactants. And is this an uphill or downhill? Well, take a look. Pretty straightforward. This is an uphill reaction. Energy has to go in in order to make it happen. All right, let's move on. So a couple of the key... A couple of the... A couple of other key things to keep in mind here when we look at delta E. If we're looking at the forward reaction... So for example, we look here on the right, um, the forward reaction delta E, when we go in the reverse direction, delta E is just the opposite sign. Makes sense. If we're going towards the right, converting our reactants to our products, then delta E is going to be positive 200, meaning we need to put in 200 kilojoules for the reaction to take place. If we go the opposite direction, we're going to get 200 kilojoules back out, so therefore it is an exothermic reaction. Remember that delta E is for the entire reaction, so you don't need to worry about moles or mole ratios or things like that. The last two things are very important to understand. Energy must always be put into a bond to break it. In order to break chemical bonds, energy must be put into it. So anytime we break chemical bonds, that is an endothermic process. Okay? It is endothermic because we have to put energy into them in order to break them. Energy is always released when bonds are made. So anytime we make chemical bonds, that is an exothermic reaction. We release energy, energy goes out to the environment. So uh, when bonds are made, when energy uh, bonds are made, energy is released, therefore they are exothermic. Now keep in mind that the reaction speed is not determined by whether or not it is an endo or exothermic reaction. The activation energy is actually what determines whether the reaction uh, moves quickly or moves slowly. The activation energy is the amount of energy required to cause the molecules to convert between reactants and products. The greater activation energy means more energy needs to be put into the system in order for the reaction to take place. So if that's really, really high, then the reaction is going to occur very, very slowly. If the activation energy is low, then the reaction is going to occur much more quickly than if the activation energy were higher in a chemical reaction. Now when we look at these reaction diagrams, at the top of the graph, a transition state occurs. This is very unstable and has very high energy, and it is literally the exact point where the bonds are formed and released. And this is pretty much done simultaneously. So you end up getting some very weird states here. Um, because we can't actually pinpoint um, exactly what types of bonds or when the bonds are formed, when the bonds are broken. Uh, but we know that they just form at the top of that transition state. That's when they have the maximum amount of energy in them. And that's what makes them unstable. We know that stable molecules tend to have very low energy that's associated with them. So at the very top, we have our transition state. That's the transition between our reactant and our product. So how do we alter the speed of the chemical reactions? Well, one way we can do this is temperature. Temperature can be used to impact the reaction rate. If we increase the temperature, the molecules are moving faster and therefore more collisions take place. 
which result in the increase in the rate of the reaction. Higher speeds of the particles increase the rates of the reactions. Remember that temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy, so some molecules will inherently be faster, some will inherently be slower than the um, other particles in the mixture. Orientation of molecules is important too. If molecules are not oriented a proper way, then a reaction is not going to take place. Um, if this were not an important requirement, then reactions would have much less activation energy. But if you take a look at the top one here, we're trying to make uh, take carbon monoxide and oxygen and create CO2 and an oxygen atom from that. Well, if the reaction, if the molecules combine in a way that isn't favorable energetically or just simply doesn't allow for bonds to be broken or formed, then the reaction will not take place. So the orientation of the molecules is very important because that helps determine whether a bond is going to be formed or whether it is going to be broken. Something else that we can do to alter the speed of the reaction is add a catalyst. A catalyst increases the rate of the reaction by lowering the activation energy. One thing that's really important to understand here is that catalysts are never used up. They're continually used in a reaction. So a low amount of catalyst can significantly impact the process of a chemical reaction. By doing this, by lowering the activation energy, this creates a more energy efficient mechanism and therefore requires less energy for the reaction to take place. If there's less energy for the reaction to take place, then the reaction will happen faster. Enzymes are a term that you're probably very familiar with, and this is just a term that we use to describe biological catalysts. So a couple other things to think, keep in mind on altering the speed of the reactions, what would you expect to happen if the concentration of the reactants were increased? Well, if we have more molecules in our reactants, then collisions are going to happen more often. And if we have more frequent collisions, then it's more likely that the orientation of the molecules themselves will orient themselves in a way where a chemical reaction can actually take place. So more frequent collisions means more products produced. So the higher the concentrations of the molecules, the more likely you are to get an effective collision and therefore are more likely to produce products at a faster rate. Hope you guys picked up on all the learning objectives for this video. Hopefully you're able to explain why uh, reactions happen in terms of energy. You're hopefully able to explain and analyze processes of endothermic and exothermic reactions and evaluate factors that impact rates of chemical reactions. This is JLAN Bio. Hope you like, subscribe, leave a comment down below. Make sure you shop merch. Hope you guys have a great day. And remember, this video was sponsored by Big K Diet Cola. All the taste, less filling. And uh, yeah, pick some up at your local Kroger today. Delicious. We'll see you guys later. Have a great day. Bye-bye.